My name is Tamara Lipsy, and I'm an aquatic biologist with the Michigan Department of Great Lakes and Energy, also known as EGLE. I've worked with the department for almost 19 years, and this past January was offered um, the opportunity to be the my core program lead for EGLE. And I was uh, super excited about the opportunity, and I'm excited to be here today and celebrate all of the work you do um, on our beautiful lakes, streams, and rivers right here in the Mitten. At the heart of the MyCore program is all of our volunteers. And I've been fortunate to talk to a few of you over the past year, maybe uh, delivering a DO meter, which we don't usually do. Um, and I always leave our conversation with hope and a smile on my face because you're all fantastic people who care deeply about our water resources. And we're so lucky to have you participate in our program. So on behalf of the entire MyCore team, I wanna give you a huge thank you. Um, we could not do this work without you. And if we are together, there would be a round of applause and celebration for all you do. But uh, so pat yourself on the back and give yourself the credit that you so greatly deserve. The entire MyCore team is attending and helping out today either as a speaker or a moderator or by attending. And we worked hard at bringing a great line of speakers today to learn from. And I wanna take a minute to thank the MyCore team for all the work they've done to put on this conference and for all the help on keeping our boat afloat, um, helping answer questions, not just from all of you, but also myself as I've been learning the ropes over the past year. So thank you everyone. In a minute, I'll go over our agenda, but first I wanted to go over our, how our Zoom event will work today. Um, we are recording the presentations today and they will be posted on the MyCore website uh, in a few days or a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So for this session, we are in everything but the breakout sessions. We're using this webinar platform. The audience is in listen only mode to minimize unintended interruptions. You can ask questions via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. The chat button is um, disabled right now when we're in web webinar. So all of your questions can go under the Q&A. Um, myself or another moderator will read the questions at the end for the keynote speaker to answer. And then during the breakout sessions, we'll be using the meeting platform where you're able to unmute yourself and mute yourself, turn your video on and off. And we'll be keeping everyone muted for most of the presentations. Um, but there will always be the chat button at the bottom of your screen where you can type in a question at any time and the moderator will be answering questions as appropriate and will read the questions at the end of every presentation for the speaker to answer. There's also a reaction button when we're in meeting mode where you can raise your hand, ask questions. You can also use the reactions to give applause or to give a thumbs up or a laugh emoji. Um, that may helps make the talks a little more interactive. Okay, so I think that covers the housekeeping for Zoom. Now we'll go over the agenda real quick. You were emailed the agenda and you can access the Zoom links for each session there. Um, directly following this welcome, we'll have the opportunity to listen to Dr. Joe Noner from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, discuss ways that my core information supports fisheries management. And I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Then we'll take a 15 minute break before we reconvene at 1015. And at that time, everyone from the MyCore team will be joining me and we'll be giving updates regarding the MyCore program, including enrollment and data entry improvements, how the CLMP summer sampling went, who received stream grants, and I will um, talk a little about how Eagle used MyCore data this past year. At 11, we'll start our first set of breakout sessions. Each session will have a separate Zoom link, which again can be found on your agenda. 
At 11, you can choose between I collected lake data, now what does it mean? How to interpret your cooperative lake managing program data and reports. And Eric Elgin will be giving that talk. Or you can turn, tune in to my core macroinvertebrate scoring and the tricky diptera, where we'll be focusing mostly on reviewing how to identify those that tricky order diptera. Both myself and Paul, Dr. Paul Steen from here in River Watershed Council will be leading that one. Then we'll have a break for lunch from 12 to 1. And then at one, we're going to have a second exciting keynote. Kat Cavanaugh will be telling us about how the Water Rangers Volunteer Monitoring Program she directs in Canada is contributing to water stewardship. And I just think that's great that we're going to be having an opportunity for an international talk today. At 1.45, we'll have our second set of breakout sessions where you can choose between moving forward with innovation, a riparian's effort to improve our lakes by Craig Keeby from Golden Drake Realty. Or you can choose inver invertebrates to know the endangered Hungerford's crawling water beetle and the invasive New Zealand mud snail. And Carrie Tansy and Emily Burke will be leading that or speaking at that. Then we'll have another 15 minute break from 2.30 to 2.45. Um, and then we will um, have our last breakout session with uh, choosing between either help, I need getting help, how to recruit helpers for your monitoring outings by Jason Frenzel from the Huron River Watershed Council. Or you can watch an appreciation of the slime growing in your favorite lake or stream, all about algae with Dr. Julian Heinlein from the Great Lakes Environmental Center. And then we're going to round out the day with an interactive session with a MyCore Ask Us Anything. Um, the MyCore team wants to hear from all of you. And a form was included in the welcome email you received for the conference. And um, we will answer the questions during the 3.30 session. But you can submit them at any time during the day. You can also submit more than one. You'll be able to use the chat for questions or you can simply raise your hand as well. So you don't have to use the form. Um, but we do wanna hear any questions you might have about any of the MyCore programs, um, maybe something you encountered throughout the year with your data entry or the website or an enrollment, um, the different parameters you sampled, um, sampling methods, and then maybe any challenges or accomplishments that you wanted to share. Um, the forum and the interactive session will be a great place to share everything. But um, the great thing about the forum is if we don't can't answer it because of time constraints or we need to look into something before getting back to you, we'll have your information, your contact information to get back with you. So with that, I would like to get started with our first keynote speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Joe Noner, who works for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources in the Fishery Div Fisheries Division Habitat Management Unit. He coordinates the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership, which conducts research, education, and outreach and conservation projects to understand and benefit fish habitat in the inland lakes of the upper Midwest. He also serves as the inland lake habitat expert for the Department of Natural Resources, and which includes developing statewide inland lakes habitat guidance on issues like large woody debris, restoration, aquatic nuisance control, watershed management, and climate change. Joe is also involved with many partnerships throughout the state um, that are focused on inland lake management. Um, so I'm sure many of you probably have seen other presentations by Joe. Um, so let's welcome Joe. Joe, you can take over. Great, thank you. And I should be sharing my screen now. You got it? Looks good. It looks great. Yep, we can see it. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about um, 
uh, something that's you know, really near and dear to my heart, and that's my core and the my core data and the citizen science monitoring um, in general. So my presentation is titled My Core Information Supports Fisheries Management. And I'll be talking about how my core supports what we do in the fisheries division of the DNR. But I'm going to start off with a, a personal example, um, and then I'll get into the, the meat of my talk. Um, so when I was a little boy, um, I spent all of my summers on a lake in Minnesota. Um, and I spent basically all of my time dreaming about going fishing and boating and just spending time on the lake. And for me, that was, uh, that was kind of the epitome of summer and, and uh, the pinnacle of, of my summer. And I really enjoyed it. And we stayed at, at my grandfather's resort. It was a mom and pop resort. And my grandfather was uh, on the lake board there. And in the early 70s, he became involved with a citizen science monitoring program in Minnesota. And so starting in 1976, he started taking measurements for secchi depth clarity um, and later for uh, nutrient monitoring on the lake. And so as a, as a you know, five-year-old, I found myself sometimes going out on the boat and lowering this weird looking white and black disc down into the water and, um, and trying to you know, determine how clear the water in the lake was. And for me, that was really, really fascinating and, and really a different aspect that I had never really considered um, being able to participate in the stewardship for the lake. You know, I wasn't just uh, kind of going fishing, but I was, I was trying to help give back to the lake. And so um, it inspired in me a sense of stewardship and accomplishment and inspiration. And I think, you know, before I get into the nitty gritty of my talk and, and what happens, you know, when you use the, collect the data and how those data get used by agencies, I think it's really important to put that human aspect to it and talk about why we all do what we do. Um, and, you know, we're doing this because we want to protect and serve as you know, stewards for our lakes for the next generations. Um, and so whether that's as a, a volunteer citizen scientist, um, whether that's me in my, in my professional role uh, with the DNR, those are, I think are um, really critical components and, and they're not to be overlooked. So I can, I can trace my professional roots directly back to citizen science monitoring. And you know, I'd encourage all of you to think about uh, that same thing, that the folks around you, whether they're your neighbors or your family, they're watching you um, and they're inspired by you and what you're doing. So, uh, so thank you for, for that. Um, oh, and here's, here's the data that, that they collected. Um, and I'll just mention, they started collecting data in 1976. And as you see, um, water quality uh, declined for a little while. They were able to identify the, the sources of that decline and implement some watershed management practices. And, and, it, and it started to go up. Um, and then recently they've seen it go up dramatically with the uh, introduction of zebra mussels. So uh, really valuable long-term data set that's uh, re resulted in some really important management for that particular lake. Okay, but we're here to talk about Michigan. Um, and so I wanna first get started by just talking about what does the DNR do exactly? And when I, when I introduce myself and tell people that I work for the DNR, probably nine times out of 10, somebody asks me whether I uh, drive around in a boat and, and give folks tickets, check their live wells, and do the things that a conservation officer does. Um, and the short answer is I don't. Um, our conservation officers do really amazing work and they're, you know, for us, really the public face of what we do in a lot of cases. Uh, more people interact with our conservation officers than our biologists and our outreach specialists and all of the other folks that fisheries has um, because they're, there are so many of them and they're out in the field. Um, so I wanna sort of set the baseline and, and the foundation for what, what all the DNR Fisheries Division does. Um, and so, our mission is that we're committed to the conservation, protection, management, use and enjoyment of the state's natural and cultural resources for current and future generations. So that's a kind of a big mouthful, but what it really says is we're here for natural resources. We wanna protect those and make sure that people can use them now and into the future. So we're thinking long-term. 
And the fisheries division is part of the DNR. And the fisheries division does a ton of stuff, really diverse um, organization and a really, um, really interesting behind the scenes uh, work that's going on. So we have a whole research section that conducts research. We, have, we establish fishing regulations, which you see in our handbooks. And, and you know, if you go out to catch fish, you, you know, that's your bag limit, and the, the sizes at, uh, at which you can catch fish. We conduct habitat management. So we have a grant that helps people to do habitat projects to conserve and protect their habitat. We also comment on proposals for permits, often that Eagle receives. Um, and we try to provide feedback on how those permits affect natural resources of the state. We stock fish, of course, throughout the state. Um, and so you may be aware of our trout or walleye stocking or musky stocking efforts, for example. We provide management recommendations. Those recommendations come through the form of our status of the fisheries reports. Um, they come through the form of our interactions with lake associations and, um, and trout and, and other fishing groups. They come through um, our work with um, conservation organizations. We conduct education and outreach. So we do our biologists and we have staff that are specifically working on education and outreach as well. Uh, so we are doing um, some of that. And then we conduct surveys and assessments. Um, and the surveys and assessments, of course, are for us to better understand what's happening in the fisheries and aquatic resources that we manage so that we can do a better job managing them. And I think that's where there's a lot of overlap, of course, between the DNR's work and my core's work. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the DNR fisheries surveys and assessment, um, just to kind of explain what we do and give you a sense for the scope of, of our operation relative to my core, um, and hopefully impart upon you the importance of the my core program. So fisheries division, conducts um, kind of two general types of surveys. One is a discretionary survey. These are surveys when a management unit, one of our biologists might have a particular question that they wanna answer on a particular water body. Maybe trout fishing has gone down in this stream uh, and we wanna understand whether there are fewer fish or whether the prey resources have gone down or whether the water quality is, is degrading. Um, maybe in a lake we wanna know where did the walleye go, for example. So we'll send a crew out and we'll um, evaluate whatever the specific questions are for that, um, for that management concern. We also have a program that conducts status and trend surveys. Those status and trend surveys are more regular and um, planned out and they use consistent methods across the state with the intention of generating some data that we can understand what's happening at the statewide level and understand the broader patterns of what's affecting our resources. So it's sort of like public health. We wanna know um, what's going on in, in our population of lakes and streams. Um, and, and our stats and trends surveys program helps us to do that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a stats and trends survey program uh, more in detail because I think that's Again, where the overlaps with MyCor um, really fall, and and the MyCor protocols were designed in part um, to be complementary to and, and uh, compatible with the DNR's existing methods. So for for lakes, um, we have two types of sites that we sample: random sites and fixed. Uh, and well, in general, there are two types of sites that we could sample: random sites and fixed sites. For lakes, we only sample random sites. So we have a list of all of the lakes that we manage or that we think we manage. So those are public waters that are accessible. There's about a little over 4,000 lakes on that list in Michigan. And we've randomized that list and we then go down, right down the list uh, every year and each management unit selects uh, a handful of a small number of lakes that they will survey. And when they go to those sites, they'll survey water quality, they'll look at shoreline development, you know, the number of docks, the number of dwellings, those sorts of things. Um, they'll, they'll assess woody habitat in the lake. Um, and then they'll assess fish populations in a number of ways with netting 
and shocking. And so we use that to have a better understanding of what's happening across the lakes um, in our state. We don't have any fixed sites. So we don't, for example, go back to a particular lake every three years or every five years and conduct the same sampling on that lake over and over and over again um, with the intention of tracking it over time. The word would be longitudinally. We're not tracking those sites uh, longitudinally. Uh, so we don't, we don't have those sentinel sites. Um, and I think that's one area where really um, my core helps us to fill in some gaps because of course that's the advantage that, that you all have is we have volunteers who live on or care about these lakes and, and you're there um, for a long period of time or you're handing off the torch to somebody who uh, can carry on that sampling. And so these time series are really valuable. In general, we sample about 30 to 35 lakes per year on our sampling uh, status trends survey program. Um, and so if, if you're doing the math, that puts us at a point of return, a period of return of about 135 years for every lake. Uh, and it's more often on bigger lakes um, because we stratify by lake size. But the point is we really don't get to lakes with the status and trends survey program as often as we would like to. And so it's incumbent upon us if we wanna be uh, managing these resources and really understanding what's going on in them to use all the data that are available. And that's where my core comes in because it's so critical and it has such a strong database um, for us to use and to leverage in our management. Um, the other gap that, that really exists is I mentioned the lakes on our list for status and trend surveys. Um, those are lakes that are accessible, that are public waters. You know, they can get a survey crew and a boat into. Um, and in some cases, that's not the lake that you live on. You may live on a private lake or there may not be great access where we can get our, our survey equipment in there. Um, and so for, for those lakes that are private, you know, really this is, this is the best option and the only, only way for us to have any information on the lake. And we still often, although we don't technically manage some of those private lakes, um, we still will provide management recommendations and advice. Um, you know, we still, still make comment on proposals to um, do permits on those lakes, for example. On the stream side, um, we have a mix of fixed and random sites. So we have, again, a randomized list of stream reaches. These are sections of stream that folks go out to and, um, and survey uh, over the course of the year. And, and then we have, ran, um, we have these fixed sites that, um, so those are the random sites. They're pulling them from a list that's randomized. And then we have the fixed sites that are, um, folks are going to the same location every so often. I think it's every three years. And they're, they're sampling it repeatedly to understand how that section is changing over time. Um, and when we go to streams, we sample water quality. Uh, we look at the riparian zone, geomorphology. We look at woody habitat. And of course, we, we assess fish populations. So this program provides a, a ton of information for us. And it's complementary to my core. And it really shows the emphasis that DNR has on the importance of long-term monitoring. It's just incredibly important. So I wanna go back to the, the mission. Probably, hopefully you saw yourself in this mission. Um, I think we share our, a lot of the same goals. We wanna make sure that our, our lakes and streams are managed uh, and preserved for now, for use now and into the future. Um, so I think then the question is, how does DNR Fisheries use MyCore data in its management to achieve this goal? And how can we do a better job of working together to share uh, toward these shared goals? I'm gonna go through four examples to kind of walk through what we do and um, put a little bit uh, more meat on, on the bones for those examples. And I'll share some other examples later. In preparation for this talk, I reached out to all of our biologists and I asked them for examples across the state. So I'll be sharing some of those and um, apologies if I get a detail wrong because some of these examples I wasn't intimately involved in. Um, so I'm gonna do my best here, but I think they're, they're really instructive. So the first one is in Lake Gogebic, and this is a lake in the UP. Um, and 
And here you have a picture of uh, a young boy with a walleye. And, you know, if this isn't the, the cover picture for the fisheries division, I don't know what is. Here you've got a happy young angler, nice size walleye, big smile. Um, you know, this is this is what we're shooting for uh, in fisheries division, right? Um, we want happy anglers. But anglers and biologists on this system noticed a decline in walleye populations, where they were catching fewer fish, uh, they were coming back with fewer fish in their surveys. And so the question was, what happened to the walleye here? Well, we knew that zebra mussels had been introduced to the lake. And we know that zebra mussels are likely to change the lake. Um, zebra mussel 101 here, zebra mussels are an invasive species. They filter feed. They're usually on the bottom of the lake or, or anchored to some other uh, structures on the lake. And so they're removing plankton uh, from the lake water column and that removes nutrients um, as well. And so what you have then is uh, the foundation of the food web is undercut and you have a much smaller food web, uh, much more, much less production within the lake as a result of these zebra mussels. This is really important um, because the, that food, those plankton, uh, provides food for young fish that depend on that, especially during the early parts of their lives, um, right after they've hatched and they haven't yet switched over to eating, you know, um, macroinvertebrates and other fishes and those sorts of things. Um, and additionally, it changes the water clarity. I alluded to it in my first slide um, on that lake in Minnesota. When you have zebra mussels come into a lake, you have water clarity going much higher. And that affects the amount of light that's getting down to the bottom of the lake. And for a species like a walleye, they actually prefer to have somewhat cloudy water um, that allows them um, more shade, provides more shade essentially, uh, and lower light conditions deeper in the water. So we had some concerns about walleye and some kind of first principles, thoughts on what might be happening in the lake. Um, and so what do we do? We went and looked at our, our data within the fisheries division uh, databases, and we found that historical water chemistry and SECI data uh, that allowed us to look at water clarity were pretty sparse. We just didn't have great data on them. And this is a big, important system. Um, and so what did we do? We then looked at data provided by my core volunteers. And I'll first go through uh, the SECI depth data. So here um, I've got the axis uh, kind of upside down, if you will. Uh, you're again lowering the SECI disk down uh, deeper into the water. And so um, and these are the depths at which you can still see the Secchi disk, right? Um, and what we saw back in 2016 is that we were probably hovering around the six and a half foot range in terms of Secchi disks uh, readings. But by 2019, we're probably in the seven and a half to eight foot range. So we are seeing that even over this four year period, water clarity is increasing on the lake. And again, that points to um, a, a smaller food web that provides less food for those, those walleye, and especially those young of the year walleye that just hatched in the spring. And that's corroborated too by the phosphorus data from uh, my core volunteers on the lake. So we see a, uh, a slight declining trend in phosphorus on the lake. And again, phosphorus is an important nutrient that is, drives the, uh, the cycle on the lake. Um, in the food web. And so it, as phosphorus goes down, that indicates that we're probably going to see um, fewer prey resources for predatory fishes. Excuse me. So this really gives us a pretty good indication that we're probably looking at um, reductions in prey and habitat for walleye. The next question then for us is, how is that affecting the fish? And so our next step is to look at the age and growth rates of walleye in the lake. So we're gonna go out and catch a bunch of walleye and at every age, we'll, we'll look at how, um, how big they are and we'll see whether they're tracking statewide trends or whether they're slower than statewide trends. And if they're growing slowly, then that's another indication that, that this food problem um, is affecting their populations. We're gonna look at their mortality. So we're gonna look at how, um, how angler catch affects the population, but also natural mortality. You know, walleye, um, you know, live and die, they, they run out of food, they 
get eaten by other things. They succumb to disease uh, as in addition to fishing pressure. So we're going to look at natural mortality and, and try to understand really what's, what's affecting this population. And then we'll look at the changes in habitat again that uh, provided by MyCor. And all of these are pieces to the puzzle as we try to figure out what's happening to walleye in Lake Ogivik. We'll bring all that information together, work with our stakeholders, and potentially consider uh, more conservative regulations on the lake that would then come out um, through our fishing guide. And that's where you see bag limits and slot sizes and those sorts of things. Um, and our hope is that we can get ourselves back to the position where we've got happy anglers here. Um, and, and, you know, that's everybody's goal. So my core data feed directly into this process for us to um, try to make management recommendations on Lake Gilgamesh. Okay, the next example is a stream example. So uh, MyCor monitors uh, that in May this year, we're out conducting macroinvertebrate sampling uh, on Shanty Creek in the tip of the mid area. And while they were sampling for macroinvertebrates, they observed New Zealand mud snails uh, in the water. And so you've got uh, a stump here with just tons of New Zealand mud snails on them. And Here's a, a little bit of a close up. They're pretty tiny, but you can see that they look like New Zealand mud snails. So the contacts um, from the Grass River Natural Area reached out to agency and academic staff who are specializing in uh, mud snails and, and reported the, the sighting. And, and it was confirmed as, as New Zealand mud snails, which are an invasive species. Um, and they're, they're starting to spread. At this point, there were I believe only six known occurrences of New Zealand mud snails across the state. So um, what happened? The next step was um, we collaborated with Grass River Natural Area staff to conduct follow-up monitoring. And we'll, we'll see if you look at the agenda, there's a, a talk on this um, and New Zealand mud snails later in the session. So, or later in the conference, I should say. So. Uh, there's another opportunity to learn more about this there, and I, this is a plug for that um, presentation. Um, but we collaborated with the Grass River Natural Area staff to conduct more follow-up monitoring and try to understand you know, where they were, how many there were, those sorts of things. We worked with Oakland University to complete eDNA surveys to understand the extent of the um, New Zealand mud snail infestation in this system. And then we conducted outreach through signage and press releases. Um, and th those are intended to help make sure that folks that are using this system in particular um, are using best, best management practices. We really wanna make sure that if you're, if you're using Shanty Creek or the, the area that was infest, infested with these New Zealand mud smells, um, that you're cleaning, uh, draining, drying your, your boats and your equipment um, so that you're less likely to transport these to other locations across the state. And then finally, we're gonna be watching closely to see if and how the macroinvertebrates in this stream section change over time, right? So this is a, a somewhat new infestation um, and we don't have a ton of samples of the macroinvertebrate community uh, within the DNR, but we, we can look to the volunteer monitoring to see how those macroinvertebrate populations change over time. And, an open question with New Zealand mud snails is, what are their effects on the stream community, um, the aquatic communities that they inhabit? And so this will help us to better understand whether, um, whether macroinvertebrates um, go down, whether they go up, what happens with the fish populations, that'll be you know, our sampling. So we're gonna learn too, and, and having that long-term monitoring will help us to do that. Long-term monitoring typically doesn't happen regarding invasive species until after the invasion occurred. Um, and so this is, you know, it's unique in that in this stream example, but, you know, across all of the MICOR program, we, we have these long-standing metrics that allow us to look at the system prior to some invasion. The next example I'd like to give is um, a statewide water quality assessment that, that Eagle is getting ready to embark on. And so this is fairly new, and, and I believe Tamara is going to uh, touch on it later with, with an update as well. Um, but 
As I mentioned before, any assessment of fisheries and lake ecosystems really should consider water quality data. If you don't know the water quality in a lake or in a stream, um, you're not going to have the foundation to understand what's going on in that system. So for me, as our lake habitat analyst, whenever I hear about a fisheries problem in the lake, the first question out of my mouth is, what's the secchi disk? Uh, and, and followed shortly thereafter by, tell me about the phosphorus, tell me about the patterns in, in, in water quality in the lake. Um, so MyCore, Eagle, and DNR have data on many lakes. Um, but those data are, are really insufficient when you look at the vast number of inland lakes that we have across the state. Um, again, you know, we've got probably six, six or 7,000 inland lakes um, that are 10 acres or larger. And, and we just have data on a fraction of those. Um, so the question then, and the management concern from our perspective is, how can we get information on all of those lakes that we um, aren't able to sample? We just don't have the, the people power to get out on all of those lakes. And fortunately for us, one of the things that, that is occurring um, that is, is just coming uh, to fruition now is that Eagle is, is funding a statewide water quality assessment um, for inland lakes. And they're collecting samples. Um, and, and so they're, they're gonna use satellites. Um, they're, they're working with a contractor, a, a researcher out of the University of Minnesota, and they're gonna use satellites to assess lake water clarity. And the way that they do that is they compare satellite images to samples collected by MICOR, EGLE, DNR, and other sources. And then they create a statistical model after they remove things like clouds and those sorts of things. Um, and they create a statistical model that helps relate the predicted water quality with the measurements that were collected in the lake by real people, um, you know, and, and really uh, reflect the actual conditions in the lake. And we see pretty, pretty good predictive relationships between the satellites and, and the water quality measurements that are taken in situ. And so then that allows the researchers at, at the University of Minnesota to estimate water quality measurements like secchi disk clarity, um, chlorophyll A, and color uh, statewide for lakes that we've never been to. Maybe there's poor access, maybe it's a private lake and there's no access. Um, it allows us to get a baseline understanding of what's happening on all of these systems. And so here's an example from Minnesota where, the, where they've implemented this program. If you're interested, you can check out the lake browser in Minnesota where they, that's their web interface and they, um, that's their public facing um, way that they communicate these data. And, and what this allows us then to do is understand what's happening on all of our lakes and understand what's happening um, over time on lakes as well. And so what you would have then is data on the water quality within the lake. So this is what the satellite sees. And, um, and here you have fairly clear water and you know, it looks like where a, a stream comes in and then you have lower clarity across the rest of the lake. Um, and then you get a lake-wide average that shows you the clarity. Here, here's clarity in meters and trends over time. So in this lake, uh, since 2010, it's been going slightly down. Um, and so we would have this sort of information for all of the lakes in Michigan. How can we use this? You know, the purpose of my talk is how does fisheries division use MICOR data? And so the MICOR data really, um, because there are so many samples, they are what fuels and drives and enables um, this sort of an approach. And, and with satellite SECI and, and chlorophyll data on, um, on all of the lakes in the state, we can prove a number of things. So we classify and assess lake habitats, um, and we would do a much better job at understanding what, our, um, what types of lakes we have. Um, we use models to estimate the presence and population size of fishes. Um, so just like with your house, maybe you've used Zillow in the past, and you go on Zillow and you look, and Zillow says, my house is worth $150,000, and it's, you know, that's based on the fact you know, your neighborhood and maybe your school district and your, um, 
the number of bedrooms and bathrooms you have. Um, well, we can do a similar thing. We can create models based on the chlorophyll and the lake size and the depth of the lake and uh, the temperatures that we expect the lake to be at. And we can get a decent sense for whether um, particular fishes are likely to be there. And again, when you're only sampling a small number of lakes per year, that really helps us to have a better sense for what's going on or what we expect to be going on in the lake. Of course, that's not perfect. Zillow, Zillow doesn't tell you what you're gonna actually sell you your house for, but it gives us a pretty good first cut um, when we wanna uh, understand what's happening in a lake that we've never been able to get to. It helps us to understand the effects of invasive species. So we can track clarity of water over time as even mussels are, or other species um, become established. It helps us to prioritize and strategize for watershed and shoreline conservation. So we wanna pick lakes where we think we can have an effect and where we think, um, excuse me, and, and where we think they're suitable for the species that we're targeting. And then it allows us to do better outreach regarding lake water quality and lake habitat. Um, you know, we need to be communicating how these things affect our fisheries and, and how citizens and stakeholders can, um, can use this information and assist with the management process locally to improve their, their lakes. So one of the ways that we can do this is, is through tools like this Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership Conservation Planner. Um, I've got the website here and I'll just plug it briefly in that you know, we can use tools that show disturbance for the shoreline or the watershed. And then we can, we can show whether it's likely that bluegill or northern pike or walleye or cold water species like uh, lake trout, um, whether those are likely to um, exist now and into the future. So we can share this information now. Our fourth example is gonna be um, on Cisco. Um, so Cisco habitat, um, Cisco are a cold water fish that lives in lakes in Michigan. They live in the Great Lakes and Inland Lakes and uh, Cisco populations in Inland Lakes are a wildlife action plan priority. So this means this is something that fisheries division really wants to prioritize. Um, and they're losing their habitat. It, essentially due to two factors. The first is temperature. Lakes are warming and the stratification period, the period where that warm upper layer and the cold bottom layer um, don't mix very well, that period is getting longer. So what that has the effect of, uh, of is, is having a longer time period where you've got a lot of warm water in the upper part of the lake. And so I'll show two graphs, um, one on top of the other here, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what we're looking at. Imagine this is a lake, you went out, you drove your boat out to the deepest part in your lake um, and you looked at the temperature and the amount of oxygen in the lake. So this, this panel shows the temperature. And what you see then is um, if you were to go out in April, the water is cold, uh, we know this. And, and it's fairly evenly distributed throughout the, the lake. Um, but if you were gonna go out in June, the water's starting to get a little warmer, especially toward the surface of the lake, and then it's colder near the bottom. And as the summer progresses, that water near the surface is, is warmer, um, and, it, and that, um, that, wa that warm water encroaches more deeply toward the bottom waters. And it, so it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and then at some point in the fall, it mixes, gets really cold. That probably happened in the last month or so. And, and now you've got a situation where uh, the lake is again mixed. If you're a Cisco and you're trying to stay in cold water, that means you're confined to this lower area of the lake. The second factor is dissolved oxygen. Cisco, not unlike trout, need cold water with a lot of oxygen in it. And we know that the bottom waters of lakes tend to lose their dissolved oxygen over the course of the summer. And the question is, how quickly are they losing it? And is that a threat to Cisco? And so again, um, you know, in this example, uh, starting in about June on, on this lake, the, the lake started to lose dissolved oxygen low in the water column. And as you went through the course of the summer, you see that really there wasn't much dissolved oxygen in the, that low cool part of the water column until uh, the fall overturn started to occur and you started to have more mixing events. So what we see then 
is these fish are getting squeezed between temperature on the top and um, dissolved oxygen on the bottom. Uh, and that, that area where they can find themselves, where they have both habitat characteristics is smaller and smaller until potentially they lose all available habitat that's suitable for them and they become locally extinct. And that's a concern for us. We've seen for this particular species, massive extinctions, um, local extinctions, we call those extirpations across the state. And that's why they're a priority for us. They're sensitive to warming temperatures, they're sensitive to nutrients. And, um, and these are some of our premier lakes in Michigan. So we wanna help try to, try to identify um, how we can protect those pr premier lakes into the future. Okay, so how do, how do my core data come into this? Just looking at the temperature and dissolved oxygen data in my core, um, we've got about 170 lakes with known suspected or locally extinct Cisco populations. Um, and I mapped those lakes. So, so all of these red and blue lakes are the lakes that have Cisco across the state. Um, and if you look at the red lakes, those are lakes where the Cooperative Lake Monitoring Program has collected temperature and dissolved oxygen profiles in the lake. So this is by far the most useful metric other than going out and actually catching the fish. Um, if you wanna be able to understand whether Cisco could persist in a lake, getting this temperature and dissolved oxygen profile is very, very clearly related to uh, the suitability for that species. And there are really strong relationships that are shown in the research between these two things. So right now we're embarking on an effort to try to get temperature and dissolved oxygen data on all of these blue lakes across the state. Um, and the great, or all of these lakes across the state. And the great news is that my core data exists on 35 of the lakes. And we've got uh, about 1800 temperature and dissolved oxygen profiles for lakes on these 35, uh, these profiles on these 35, 35 lakes. So we really do have a lot of information on these. And that allows us to model their populations in the future, prioritize conservation efforts and protection efforts um, as we move forward. So we've got some other examples of my core data in action. Um, similar, similar assessments for walleye on mullet, burt, black and long lakes, um, just a, a smattering of, of places where they've been used. They're, they're used elsewhere. We use them on our status of the fishery reports to help make management recommendations. Um, we use them to assess trophic status for lakes when we provide recommendations um, on, on the stream side um, and, and on lakes, really. Um, we use them to help understand prey resources and indicators of stream health. Uh, so, you know, the, those macroinvertebrate data are really important for showing changes after a, maybe a dam is removed or to make an argument that a dam ought to be removed. Um, we use them for AIS surveillance, similar to the mud snail example that I mentioned, trying to understand fish kills. If there was a fish kill on the lake, then that helps us to diagnose whether there were habitat issues and then whether it's appropriate to stock fish. If you don't know what the water column is doing, then you really don't know whether it's appropriate to stock fish or not. So this is really important baseline data. I wanna to just touch briefly on then the benefits of my core data as I see them. Um, first, the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. And I think that's, you know, we have shared goals and we want to make the most effective decisions that we can. So my core data help us to do that. Um, those data are yours and they, they exist on a public database that you'll always be able to use. Um, and they wouldn't be collected otherwise. Those data, um, you know, the state agencies are limited in our funding and our staffing. And we just aren't able to get on the 6,000 lakes um, in Michigan that we would love to be working on. Um, and those data then are shared for larger regional and statewide analyses that maybe behind the scenes are gonna produce information like the satellite uh, water quality data that I mentioned uh, to really change the way that we manage lakes. And finally, I think most, uh, not to be overlooked is that collecting my core data gives, uh, gives us the ability, gives you the ability to have a seat at the table um, as a doer and as a person of action and, and interacting with our biologists. So my last slide here is 
I'll just mention, um, if you would like to work with DNR Fisheries Division and work with our biologists, I encourage you to reach out to our fisheries biologists. Um, and so what you can do, if you go to the DNR Fisheries webpage, um, click on management units here, and you'll come to a page that looks like this. Um, and our management units are, are based on watersheds. And you can click on a, a management unit. Let's pretend I click on Southern Lake here, or Southern, Southern Lake Michigan uh, here. And that would bring you to a web page that looks like this, um, where you've got the basin coordinator that coordinates the entire Lake Michigan basin, the unit supervisor that coordinates um, the Southern Lake Michigan biologist, biologists, and then you've got biologists that work on particular watersheds. So if you have a project um, on the Grand River or in a lake that's in the Grand River watershed, you'd talk to Addie Dutton. If you have a project that's on the St. On the St. Joe's or in a lake that's in the St. Joe's watershed, you talk to Matt Diana. So this is how you can contact us, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, we have um, we have lots of questions um, from our, our users and stakeholders, and and we love talking with you and hearing reports and and learning how to work better together. So with that, hopefully, um, you know this has given a good sense for how the DNR uses these data. I know I'm running a little bit shy on time. Uh, I do have my email and contact information here. Uh, so I'll, I'll be happy to take questions for the, the remainder of this, this time period. And then I would encourage you to, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email or phone uh, and we can always talk more. Thanks so um, much, Joel. If we, since we go right into a break, we can go a little bit over if we need to. We, have, we do have a few questions. Um, does, the first one is from Sally Petrello, Friends of the Rouge. Does the DNR only <coughs> survey public lakes? Um, the short answer is no. Um, we survey lakes that um, are public that we've stocked in the past. So if, if we've historically stocked a lake um, and there's one more um, qualifier in there, um, but for the most part, it's, it's only public lakes. They're, they're just, there's a handful of exceptions. Okay, thanks. Um, somebody wanted to know um, about assessing the AIS issues in lakes you visit. Do you assess AIS in the status and trend lakes I think they're referring to? It, certainly, um, certainly when we are out on the lakes, we're noting uh, the, the species that we observe. Um, we don't have uh, plant monitoring, for example, so we, um, we don't specifically Row rakes and, and assess where um, maybe Starry Stormlord is, for example. Um, but we do note our, our technicians and biologists, when they're out there, would note that they observe um, invasive species and those sorts of things. Um, and, and of course, some of our sampling picks that up. Um, if you've got zebra mussels colonizing gear, or if you are catching, um, you know, a species of, of fish that would be susceptible to your gear. Um, so we do, we do capture, collect and observe um, species in the course of our sampling, um, but that I'm aware of, we don't through those programs specifically um, survey. Now we do have other folks that are going out and doing targeted surveys for AIS. I don't wanna give the impression that we're, we're not surveying for AIS, but it's not part of our status and trends program. Um, and to follow up that with that a little bit, um, and I can maybe help a little bit with this question if you, um, but you probably have more interaction with the AIS people than I do even. Um, somebody wants to know, they have a management board and a professional consultant doing AIS surveys annually. And they wanna know if DNR and us here at Eagle have access to the resource. Um, is there a requirement for these boards to supply the data? And then if it's publicly available. That's a really good question. Um, if the management, if, if your professional consultant is um, submitting a permit application 
or aquatic nuisance control, then, um, so, so we're talking about invasive aquatic plants here, um, then the, some, of those, uh, some of those data would be shared with the DNR as part of that permit application. Um, and they'd be shared with Eagle, um, and then they'd be shared with DNR uh, that comments on the permit. Um, but in general, the water quality and vegetation data that consultants collect is otherwise, if it's not required through a permitting process, um, it's typically not, there's no mechanism for direct sharing uh, with state agencies where it would get into our database. Sometimes it comes up in, in the course of conversations, um, but we don't have it at our fingertips right away. Hopefully that answers the question. I'd be happy yeah, to and then I was just gonna um, add that there's the, what's it called, the Missin Midwest Invasive Species Network where anybody from the public um, can submit um, invasive species documentation. Um, yeah, great. So there's that option too. All right. Um, I'll just do a couple more because we don't want to, we want some time to have a little bit of break. But um, how, somebody, this is a quick one. How do we find out if our lake is one of the 4,000 lakes on the list? Uh, you can reach out to me directly. Um, okay. That's the best mm -hmm. way. <laughs> My email's here on the screen. If it's a public lake with public access, it's probably on the list. We just don't know how long in the 135 years it's going to get to. Uh, yeah, and 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 that's then if if you want to start having conversations about you know when do we expect that there's going to be a survey on my lake, uh, the best person to reach out with, with to would be the fisheries biologist in your area. They're going to have a better sense for that time than I would, um, and that's who I would refer you to. Okay. Um. Are there any grants available to be part of the statewide water quality assessment programs in, say, like the St. Joseph watershed? Um, <laughs> great question, Carolyn. And um, mm -hmm. maybe we can more talk, talk more offline about, you know, what particularly you're thinking about. And there are um, grants available to, to be part of water quality programs broadly, um, you know, Eagle has non-point source um, monitoring programs. DNR Fisheries Division has the Fisheries Habitat Grant. Um, so, so there are opportunities. Um, I, I think I would need to know a little bit more specifics about what exactly you're looking for to, to point you in the right direction though. Um, that, that satellite program that I was talking about, that's gonna cover the whole state. So that'll, that should cover the St. Joe watershed, um, but I suspect you're talking about something a little bit different. So let's let's talk offline. You have my number. Um, if you use satellites, doesn't zebra mussel infest infestations impact the data? How do you account for that when you're doing the statewide assessment? The answer is yes. Um, zebra mussels affect water quality um, and, and that's what we're trying to assess. So zebra mussels, when they affect water quality, they're affecting the clarity. They're often taking nutrients out of the water. And that's what we would see. It doesn't change the physical properties of water. Um, so the, the assessment that the satellites, um, create that their, their estimate of water quality is still that relationship is still the same they still are able to assess it um, but they are able we would expect that with zebra mussels there would be a change in water quality and the zebra mussel and the the satellites would be able to detect that um, one more we'll do one more will the statewide water quality assessment extend to streams not that i'm aware of um, and i I want to say too here that um, that this is a project that was just recently put together, um, and so I, you know, I was a little bit nervous to even uh, talk in depth about it because really it's it's coming together now um, and and moving forward uh, under the supervision of Eagle, uh, and then DNR plans to use those data once they're uh, created. So um, 
So some of the, the nitty gritty on, on how that project would be implemented, really the questions are best, uh, best suited for the folks in Eagle. Um, and, I, and I would defer some of those, but my understanding, um, you know, third hand is that, is that those data are gonna be focusing on lakes. And that's, you know, it's pretty difficult to assess stream water quality with the satellite because uh, you need a large chunk of water exposed to the sky to assess clarity. Um, and that's not the case for, for many streams, right? In many streams, you've got trees that are overhead um, that are, or, or debris that's in the stream that would affect that measurement. Um, whereas that's lakes, you can go right out to the middle of the lake and, and you can be pretty sure that you're gonna have an unimpeded view and that the water's gonna be sufficiently deep enough that it's not gonna be obstructed um, right. If you, if you shot a satellite at a, an area that's half of a foot deep and the clarity comes back as a half of a foot, uh, it's not because the water quality is low. It's because there's rocks at the bottom of, because it's really shallow there. So you have to, you have to go to these areas of the lake where it's deep and, uh, and streams, it's a little more difficult to do that sort of thing. So. That's a great point. Well, I want to thank you um, again for giving all of these examples on how many different ways the MyCore data is used and is going to be used. Um, I think it's really exciting. I uh, particularly liked your Zillow example for explaining models. I might steal that someday. <laughs> um, but if we were all together, we would give you a great round of applause and thank you so much, Joe, for coming. Um, all right, we'll well, take... Thank you. I look forward to the rest of the conference. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at 1015 with uh, the MyCore team giving you what's up and what's new. Thanks everyone. <laughs>